Okay, so Nikki is now in the room and I think everything is, should be, she's on camera, there we go. All right, so once again, thank you very much for being here tonight. Um, I am so excited to be introducing Nikki Grimes. She is an incredibly talented person. Not only is she an artist, but she's a poet, a best-selling uh, award, a best-selling author and award-winning author. Uh, some of her titles include Garvey's Choice, Barack Obama, Son of Promise, Child of Hope. Oh, don't we miss that? Um, and I'm so excited to have her here today. She'll be talking about her book, Legacy, Women Poets of the Harlem Renaissance. And don't forget you're muted, Nikki. So you have to unmute yourself. I don't know if you can. There you go. Okay. Am I admitted? Am I already here? You're here. You're here and ready to go. Okay, good. <laughs> <laughs> Hello. This is title four. Before we were women, we were our daddy's daughters. The dark princesses who stole our father's hearts. A single story says they gave us little except disappointment, but ask us. Ask me and I'll chronicle the currency of love dad splurged on me, the gift of yes you can, and modeling dignity in the face of vile attacks on his manhood without ever shedding his humanity or surrendering to sorrow. Like many dark fathers, he'd reclaim his soul in the sweet strains of music, a lesson we daughters learned, siphon sadness through a song. That poem titled Before is one I wrote with lines borrowed from little known poet, May B. Cowdery. You'll find her in Legacy, Poets of the Harlem Renaissance, a companion to One Last Word. This is the way Legacy opens. Some days, I try to hide my new woman body, drape it in shirts two sizes too big, to keep bug-eyed boys from staring in my direction. Other times, I get mad if they don't look. It's worse, though, when they act like girls ain't nothing. I wish I didn't care either way. Today, Miss Hicks, my teacher, notices me hanging my head, pulls me aside, and tells me I need to find my girl power. I roll my eyes, certain she's crazy, for imagining I got any kind of power in me. I know you don't see it, she says. What's she doing reading my mind? Time you learn a little history. The women in our race have always gone from strength to strength. Let me introduce you to a few women who can teach you what I mean. She hands me three books on the Harlem Renaissance. Whatever, I mumble under my breath. But I promise to read them. Why not? I've got nothing better to do. When one last word was released a few years ago, I was over and was overwhelmingly met with praise and acclaim. I was thrilled largely because in my heart of hearts, I'd been cradling the dream of a golden shovel poetry collection featuring women poets of the Harlem Renaissance. Thanks to the success of One Last Word, this passion project was suddenly viable. That's another one. Um, sorry. Okay. Um, for those who haven't read one last word and who may not be familiar with the poetry form called the golden shovel on which it's based, uh, let me explain. In golden shovel poetry, you borrow one or more lines from an existing poem, lay the words in the right margin, one by one, and then you create new lines, each one ending in one of the words. If the line 
as three words, for instance, you end up with a new three line poem. If the original line has five words, you end up with a five line and so on. Form designed to stretch your mental muscles, to be sure. But that's precisely what I love about it. I'm a glutton for punishment, but only of the literary variety. The Golden Shovel Poetry Form, newly minted by poet Terence Hayes, was originally created to honor the work of Gwendolyn Brooks in a collection titled The Golden Shovel Anthology, which, by the way, I highly recommend. I was honored to be one of its contributors. And once I tried this form, I was hooked. I immediately started looking for projects in which I could experiment with this form further. One Last Word was the first of my books to result from that exploration. I've since done the same with the picture book, The Watcher, and now have explored it further in Legacy, my newest Harlem Renaissance title. This book about women, written by a woman, illustrated by women, and edited by a woman was a work of pure joy. Joy shakes me like the wind that lifts a sail, wrote Clarissa Scott Delaney in her poem, Joy. And I answered with Leah's reunion. Yearly, I join the celebration of woman joy, the blessing of unchecked tears when calamity shakes us or when beauty surprises, the comfort of sisters cradling me when death slithers into the neighborhood like a rattler striking yet another sweet son, the promise of him broken. But there is also the cleansing wind of deep belly laughter as we gather round that love-worn kitchen table, licking morsels of each story that lifts us. Without this maternal cruise guidance, a brown girl like me would simply be adrift. No wind, no sail. I might never have discovered Delaney's joy or my own, had I not found her while doing research for this book. Women hold up half the sky. I love that quote, because I know it to be true. And yet in this world, the true value of women expressed in that now familiar saying is rarely recognized, let alone celebrated. And there's a reason for that. Stories and the record of our accomplishments are often hidden. If the history we are taught were poured into a cup, you'd find that cup half empty. The history of women would be largely missing. And yet, if you take even the smallest spoon and begin to dig into all of history, you'll quickly discover records of remarkable women the world over, women that few of us are aware of. Look to the world of classical music, and next to Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart, you'll find his sister, Maria Anna, a woman Mozart considered an equally gifted composer. Dip into the realm of art, and next to Rodin, you'll see Harriet Hosmer, Gertrude Vanderbilt Whitney, and Camille Caudel less celebrated sculptures of the same period. Sink your spade deep enough into the tombs of the pharaohs and you'll run headlong into Hatshepsut, the female pharaoh who the men of that period did their best to bury all mention of. In the sciences, we're all taught the names of astronauts like John Glenn, but until recently, few could recite the names of early NASA scientists, mathematicians, and engineers like Dorothy Vaughn, Mary Jackson, Christine Darden, and Katherine Johnson, who helped to make Glenn's successful orbit of the Earth possible. We know their names now because of a little Hollywood film called Hidden Figures based on a book by Margot Leach. So we come back to books 
and legacy, women poets of the Harlem Renaissance. If you've read any of my work, you know that I am all about female characters. I do occasionally feature boys in my books, to be sure. But in the main, my focus is on the female. Whether in the realm of fiction, Denitra Brown, Jasmine Sh Harris Richmond, Joy Lynn, Gabriella, Diamond Daniel, or nonfiction, Bessie Coleman, Harriet T or Kamala Harris. I write about female characters and I read about them as well. And in all the years of my reading, and there have been a lot, I've noticed that literature is one more place where if you begin to dig, you'll find hidden female figures. And that's certainly true of the wellspring of Black poetry created during the Harlem Renaissance. Most well-read people can readily tick off the names of a few Harlem Renaissance poets like County Cullen, Paul Lawrence Dunbar, and of course, Langston Hughes. However, ask these same readers to cite women poets of the period, and the sound you hear will likely be crickets. Yet, begin to dig where academics like Maureen Honey and Camille Dungy have gone before, and you'll meet 20, 30, 40, perhaps, 50 women poets of the Harlem Renaissance you never knew existed. We shouldn't be surprised. It's always been a challenge to find records of the accomplishments of Black women, even of those who were writers themselves. Zora Neale Hurston, a prolific writer of the Harlem Renaissance, is a perfect case in point. Hurston is mandatory reading in schools nationwide today. But that's only because Alice Walker rescued her work from history's dustbin. Likewise, there's a long list of women poets from the Harlem Renaissance of whom many are unaware. In these pages, you will meet some of the remarkable female poets and groundbreaking women of the Harlem Renaissance who created alongside of and often nurtured many of the male poets we know. They didn't all produce poetry collections of their own, but each played an integral part in the historic period in question. And there are so many. I love the work of Angelina Weld Grimke, for example. She wrote short stories, essays, plays, and poetry. But the father who was vice president of the NAACP and on were abolitionists who also advocated for women's rights. It's no wonder Grimke wrote unflinchingly about lynchings and all manner of violence against her people. But she also turned her literary attention to love and nature as well. In Legacy, I featured Grimke's short poem, Dusk. Twin stars purpling Sorry, twin stars through my purpling pain. The shriveling husk of a yellowing moon on the wane and the dusk. I took that first line as inspiration for my poem titled, Vanish. I could vanish were it not for the twin street lights outside my window imitating stars. Without their brightness, you'd peer through half-open blinds and find barely an outline of my blue-black body, skin purpling toward midnight, my image invisible as a glass. Blanche Taylor Dickinson was another poet whose work inspired me. She attended Simmons University, then taught in Kentucky for several years. Her poetry was published in Opportunity, Crisis, American Poet, Caroling Dusk, and Ebony and Topaz. Though considered a true beauty herself, Dickinson's poems address the pain of Black women who feel invisible and ugly when compared to white standards of beauty. Her themes were powerful and all too familiar. I especially loved her poem, 
four walls. It begins, four great walls have hemmed me in, four strong high walls, right and wrong, shell and shant. It ends with the lines, four walls to rise and pen me in, this conscious world with guarded men. I answered her poem with what girls can do. Mr. Spencer thinks I don't notice the four negative notes he constructs like walls boxing us in. Girls can't, shouldn't, won't, wouldn't. To him, a girl's only purpose is helping a boy rise to his potential. As if girls are devoid of skill and promise. Ha! Huh? Men tried putting Shirley Chisholm in a pen. May Jameson and Misty Copeland too. Now me? No. I'll decide what I'll be. What box, if any, I fit in. Effie Lee Newsom also caught my eye. Newsom worked as children's librarian at Central State College and the College of Education at Wilberforce and was a prolific poet. Her body of work was primarily focused on the young. In Legacy, I included her poem, The Bronze Legacy to a Brown Boy. It didn't hurt that I included the word legacy in the title. Tis a noble gift to be brown, brown, her poem begins. And then the last stanza, to be brown like thrush and lark, like the subtle wren so dark. Nay, the king of beasts wears brown. Eagles are of the same hue. I thank God then, I am brown. Brown has mighty things to do. Eagles are of the same hue as the line I borrowed from my poem, Like an Eagle. No one chooses his pigment, but note, eagles share the glistening shades of bronze my folk are blessed with. This sun-drenched color is all the rage of generations who baked on beaches for a bit of this glow. I know it's unseemly to boast. All the same, I wouldn't trade my melatonin skin for any other hue. This collection also gave me the opportunity to share poetry that featured Black people with nature, something we rarely get to see in children's literature, which is a space I'd like to help fill. And so I was happy to include poems by Anne Spencer, um, for whom nature was a favorite topic. I was excited to find her, of course, because she was an avid gardener. And anyone who knows me is aware that I share that same passion. The daughter of former slaves, Ann Spencer, served 20 years as librarian for Dunbar High School and helped establish Lynchburg's NAACP. Her poetry appeared in journals like Crisis and anthologies like The Book of American Negro Poetry. And she has the distinction of being the first African-American woman poet featured in the Norton Anthology of Modern Poetry. After Spencer retired, she devoted hours to her garden. One of the poems that blossomed from that time was titled, Earth, I Thank You. I immediately fell in love with the opening lines. Earth, I thank you for the pleasure of your language. Borrowing the words from those lines, I wrote a response titled, Sweet Sister. Clay creatures, we forget our sisterhood with earth as if we could survive without her nourishment. I know better, but did I always? I thank her now. Sink your teeth into a peach and so will you. Imagine a world without rosemary or rose, even for a moment. Where would the flavor or the fragrance be? 
How we'd miss the quiet pleasure earth brings to nose and tongue of which we are not worthy. Earth, your generosity deserves to be met with love's language. Throughout this collection, you'll meet Georgia Douglas Johnson, Gwendolyn Bennett, and Jesse Redmond Fawcett, who you might be familiar with, and lesser known gems like Mavie Cowdery, Effie Lee Newsom, and Blanche Taylor Dickinson, whose poems I've shared. Along with many more, including Esther Popel, Ida Rowland, Helene Johnson, and Alice Dunbar Johnson, Alice Dunbar Nelson, and yes, there is a relation <clears throat> by marriage to Paul Lawrence Dunbar. These women include some of the first black female PhDs. They were teachers, librarians, directors of cultural institutions. They hosted art salons and edited some of the very literary magazines featuring the work of Cullen and Dunbar Hughes and their female counterparts. Everywhere you look, there is literary gold to be found among women who deserve to be celebrated. I want young readers to know that such women existed. I hope readers will be inspired to do a bit of digging on their own. Where do ideas come from? is never an easy question to answer. If you ask me how I chose the poets and the poems featured in Legacy, the answer would be no easier. But I can tell you this, in all of the choices I made for this book, I was looking for poems that sparked ideas that were somehow connected to current events, ideas that for whatever reason led me to issues in today's headlines that affect me on a deep visceral level. Why? Because I was looking for poems in the past that connected to the present. Poems that would resonate with today's young readers. The poems I selected always end up being poems that made me feel a certain way. Poems that immediately struck me. Poems with lines that would sink their hooks into me and never let go. I remember coming across a line in a poem by Gertrude Parthenia McBrown that affected me that way. This was a poet I was happy to discover. McBrown, who held a master's in education from Boston University, was a poet and playwright. She directed children's theater and published both children's and adult poetry, including the picture poetry book, A Collection for Children. You definitely want to learn more about her. But the poem she wrote that demanded my attention was Jehovah's Gesture. But Brown's poem had a line toward the end that I just couldn't shake. The line was, a hurricane of souls. I found myself repeating it over and over and over again. It became sort of a meditation for me. I was trying to glean what it might mean and why it had such a pull on me. A hurricane of souls. A hurricane of souls. A hurricane of souls. Finally, one morning, I woke up with that line in my head like an earworm. And I suddenly understood who those souls were. They were the souls of the children living in cages at the Mexican border. They were the souls caught in the hurricane, trapped in the storm. That's who those souls were to me. As soon as I understood that, I was able to write a poem in response. It's called Judgment. Caged Innocence. We study the heavens for a lightning bolt of justice, a hurricane of grace towards parents whose sole sin is love of us and freedom. Our sin being labeled disposable souls. That's how I came to include and write a response to one of the poems in Legacy. In another case, I went on the hunt for a specific line in a poem that would allow me to write about climate change because it is such a major issue 
of our time. I'm certainly experiencing the effects of it living in Southern California, where we're suffering the highest temperatures, the longest droughts, and the deadliest wildfires the state has ever seen, as you are there in the North as well. While working on this collection, I found a line in a poem by Angelina Well Grimke that took me where I wanted to go. The poem uh, is at the spring dawn, and it includes the line, and the red sun shouldered his way up. The poem I wrote following that line is called Faithful. The punctured ozone layer bleeds radiation, and we offer complaint without apology for the years of desecration Earth has suffered. Red is no longer the color of jubilation, but warning. The sun will now allow wildfires to run rampant. Nature shouldered the brunt of man's mistreatment too long. Now it's his turn to pay. Even so, it is the way of creation to be faithful. Notice, each dawn, the sun comes up. Readers, young and old, will be meeting those most of these remarkable poets on the page for the first time. And in the biography section, young readers will learn that poets like Effie Lee Newsom and Gertrude Mar Martinia McBrown wrote poetry especially for them. The themes that Spencer and all of the other poets in Legacy wrote about have as much resonance now as they did when they were first written. Esther Popel's poem, Flag Salute, a dark commentary on the Pledge of Allegiance, is a perfect example. It could have been written today with a special dedication to Colin Kaepernick. I responded with a poem titled, A Mother's Lament. Ancestral blood waters cotton fields and the earth I stand on. A history begun under lash. No pledge of liberty until war forced it. My people's allegiance to country was wrung from hearts of hope to one day be treated equal to the sons of the ones who shipped us naked to these shores under freedom's flag. Legacy is only a beginning of my exploration into this subject matter. This book was not big enough to include all of the wonderful Black women poets I found, but it is a start. As often happens with research, the more you look, the more you find. Along the way, I discovered new poets, which was exciting enough in and of itself, but I also encountered the origins of poetry and fiction for young Black readers, something I certainly never expected to find. Each discovery sent me down a different rabbit hole, and I had to keep reminding myself that there was a book to be written, and I needed to focus on the issue at hand. Of course, all that means is that I'll need to go back at some point and root around for more literary nuggets to play with. As you engage, with customers about this book. Keep in mind that Legacy offers a wealth of entry points. Possible discussion topics include, but are not limited to, race, identity, social justice, equity, women's rights, immigration, climate change, and of course, the Harlem Renaissance. Legacy is a perfect place to spark conversation, laugh a little, cry a little, and learn something along the way. I'll end with Legacy's closing poem, Journey's End. I turn the final page of the final book, swallowing each word of wisdom, 
I breathe deep and feel something soft but strong, brushing once knobby shoulder blades. A quiet unfolding of leathery limbs emerging from bone and skin. Thank Miss May, Miss Angelina, Miss Anne, and all the others for these new and mighty glistening things called wings. They lift me from the smallness of others' expectations, reminding me that I am more than anyone gives me credit for. Thank you. Thank you, Nikki. That was great. That was incredible. Thank you. <sighs> I, I also meant to tell you this earlier, but that lipstick color is also great. <laughs> Thanks. Um, I don't know. Are we doing any Q and A? Um, we can. Emma said that the PDF didn't come through, but if Nikki wanted to share some of the art, we have a little bit of time. Okay, awesome. Okay, then I will do that because the art is awesome. <laughs> This first piece is by Equa Holmes, who also did the cover. And I just am so in love with her work in general. I'm just gonna kind of scroll through. You can see the art is all very different. Everybody has a different style which I really love. So you have quite a diverse cross-section of art by some of the most exciting African-American women artists today. So this book is, I, it could almost be a coffee table book. It's just so beautiful. spend hours just looking at it and the production quality is fabulous as it was with one last word it's very heavy paper so it has the best possible um, quality and color and texture the book feels substantial it has weight to it which is also marvelous this is one of my favorite pieces by elizabeth zunian who i do a lot of work with and i'm wild about her her art and her palette is unusual. And look at that lace. This is not to die for people, I'm telling you. <laughs> and this is from before the, the work was finished. So look at that. Yeah. This is a piece that went with Mother's Lament. One of the last poems I read, and that's just a sketch. So I don't have this from when it was a finished work. And that's Pat Cummings, What Girls Can Do. Pat and I go back a long way. I'd love to have her in the book as well. So there's lots to enjoy. There you go. Uh, oh, a lot to look forward to. A lot to share. Yes, indeed. That was that beautiful. Yeah. Thank you again. And thank you not only for sharing your words, but sharing that beautiful art. My pleasure, all the way around. <laughs> um, okay.